Cozy is good. We like cozy in Christ alone. So very, very thankful for all of you to be here. I'm not going to take long, but some important introductions must be made as we get off the ground. Uh, real quick, just be reminded, um, printed material, it helps sometimes. On the back is the schedule, in Christ alone. Here we go. Today is Sunday. Everybody know it's Sunday? A uh, couple of you. That's good. That's good. Some of you know it's the first day of the week. We celebrate the Lord Jesus Christ around here. Every Sunday's Resurrection Sunday, isn't it? It's the first day of the week. They ran to the tomb. He is not there. That's all right. I heard a really good hymn right here and heard some good preaching about the fact that Jesus Christ is still alive and at the right hand of the Father. So in Christ alone. Uh, a couple introductions, as I mentioned. Vance family, would you please stand up? Because not everybody was in the fellowship hall. Sean, Jerry, the kids. <laughs> Son is somewhere else. Hallelujah. Good. You're finally able to get rid of your son. No, I'm not. No, no. He, I'm sure he's around somewhere getting in trouble with Andrew. Is he getting in trouble? Yeah, praise the Lord. That's good. Um, also, too, of course, um, is Mario in here? Oh, Mario's in there preaching. Sorry, Mario, of course, is with us. He is from Mexico City. The Vances, we have been supporting them for a lot of years. Real quick, in this handout, the list of missionaries. The great question of Joe Hendricks' men. How many missionaries do we have? Nobody knows that I put it in here. Pass it out. You didn't know I was going to quiz you, did you? For anybody that can tell me real fast and then name them all off. But that is something for you to be able to grab. But the advances, we have been supporting you for a few years. At least five or six, maybe, from the first, uh, from the get-out, so, uh, from the get-go. So we'll be hearing a little more from Sean in the coffee house as well, as well as, of course, in preaching the word this morning. Um, also, too, we flew in a special guest to preach just in case um, George can't handle it. Uh, Mike. Matovich. Pastor Mike, would you please stand up just to say hi. You are a friend of our church. We love you dearly. Thank you for stopping by. And uh, we're counting on George to make sure he makes it through. But just in case, the theme is in Christ alone. Um, and it, it, is a, it is quite a subject as we already found out. And we're looking forward to hearing Pastor George. One quick uh, introduction before I uh, introduce uh, Pastor George. Uh, his uh, favorite son, well, for the moment, and uh, primary son and number one, uh, Chris Grace. Would you please stand up? Chris came to hang out with his dad. Uh, he lives in Charlotte, North Carolina with his wife and three boys. They let him alone for a few days to be with his dad. Actually, I'm sure it's a very wonderful relief for your wife and children to not have you around. Real quick, 30-second uh, story. Uh, baseball card, Mark Brown, Tops, 1986. This is the first young man ever, I bet you were probably 15, 16, 17, came up to me in the lobby of First Bible Baptist Church in January, February, and said, hey, can you sign your baseball card? I went, <laughs> what are you talking about? What did you do? Go print one off on the internet? Uh, for the, no, you have a baseball card. And he was the very first person that ever told me that there was a Tops baseball card. Uh, at the time, now it's worth 10 cents, but back then it was worth 15. So, and with my autograph on it, it's worth 5 cents. So that's, uh, that's a keeper. Don't you lose that thing, okay? I'm so glad to see you. Gosh. And uh, thank you, God, for just putting things together. I don't want to take much more time away. Um, I'll mention different things maybe during the week, or maybe I'll just, you hear my voice too much. I can't say enough, so I will just be careful to not get uh, overcome. Uh, I thank George Grace for his friendship over all the years. He's the first pastor I ever knew. And uh, I got saved in 83. Little did I know, if I'd known this, maybe I wouldn't have stuck around. But in Rochester, New York, we're playing ball. And uh, he had just taken the church in 1983. So he was a rookie uh, senior pastor at the time. And boy, was I a rookie in Jesus. And uh, over many years, almost 40 years, we've known each other. And I know he's told stories like the testimony thing about my shorts being in his chair and all that stuff. We have decided we're putting that to rest. 
That's the last time it's ever mentioned again until you mention it again. But Pastor George Grace has been just a very special friend, of course, pastor and mentor and disciple maker in my life. And uh, I would not be standing here in the Lord without him. I'm so thankful for all that he's done for this church. For me personally, of course, Bobby and I, Becky, we know, and Cheryl and everybody. But uh, I thank you for just continuing to do that, which God's called you to do. So let's keep on doing it. Please welcome Pastor George Grace. I come out here and I have so many, many good memories of just this area, the people of Kansas City. I first came out here in the 70s, that is the 1970s, not the 1870s. I came out here in the 1970s. I was a youth pastor. I was in my 20s and uh, came out and did a youth camp for Kansas City Baptist Temple back then, and uh, over the years, I've, I, I know that I've been to Kansas City 50 times anyway, to preach in different churches, made so many wonderful friends over the years, and just when I come here and people walk in, oh, George, I, I, you know, I met you 35 years ago, 38 years ago, 27 years ago, you know, I told my son, I said, you know, I'm really struggling with this. Because all these people, they look so much older than they used to back when I met them. <laughs> and I must not, because you all know me, they all come up and say, hi, George. But I look at them and I go, I don't know who, you, you know, I'm sorry I don't remember you, but because my, I'm an ageless individual, I suppose, or whatnot. But um, nonetheless, I know I, it was advertised that I would be here, so you were expecting to see me. I wasn't expecting to see Pastor Manovich, and he walked up to me, he was about that far away from me, and said hi to me, and uh, I forget exactly what he said. Oh, he said, hello, Dr. Grace, and I said, I'm not even a nurse, you know, and, uh, <laughs> but it dawned on me, I recognized his voice. I was just with him this year in April in, in uh, Las Vegas. We had a meal together, we stopped there and visited my wife and I, and uh, he was right here, and, but um, he's just half the man he used to be. When he worked with me at First Bible in Rochester, he was a hefty son of a gun. He was, I, I got a picture of him riding a tractor, and it's, it's hard to figure out which one is the tractor. That's all I can say. <laughs> he was a big boy back then. He was eating well. He was eating well. Anyway, it's, it's a joy to be here. It's a joy to have my son with me and Bobby Bonner and I've said this to Bobby countless times he is one of my heroes Bobby you are one of my heroes and Becky it's so good to see you and I mean that you are the things that uh, God has used you for in Africa and just our times together and uh, I can understand why you're a little overwhelmed Mark yeah I am overwhelmed right now too I'm honored to be here to preach anywhere any to anyone but particularly to this group of people today. Would you join me in a word of prayer? And, and I'll put that stuff aside so we can get into the word. Lord, I'm thankful, grateful, I'm blessed, a blessed individual, not lucky, not fortunate. I'm blessed. Blessed to have so many good friends. I'm blessed to enjoy the fruit of salvation, the fruit of your labors and your death and, and the sacrifice on the cross of Calvary. Bless our meeting here this week. This is a missions conference. Um, this is uh, the uttermost part of the earth. When, G when that was, the Great Commission was given, uh, Kansas City, Missouri uh, was probably largely uninhabited at that time. But here we are all these years later and we're still preaching the same truth the same, about the same person. Christianity isn't a religion, it's about a person, the person of Christ. And we want to uplift, honor, and glorify him here this week as we've done already in our worship we ask these things today in Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Before we get going, I want to encourage you, your pastor held this up. He didn't say anything about this, but I will. On the inside here, there's a, it's called a message from Pastor Mark. 
Now, I want to encourage everybody to read that. And, and I don't say that because it's, it's just an incredible piece of literature or prose or it's poetic or whatever. And it's written well. I kind of do a lot of proofreading. I've read a lot in my life. So I know when something's written well, and this is written very well. However, what's important about it is this. What he said, he is the man that God works through among others here, but primarily through your pastor in a local church. But he's written, he's put his heart on this piece of paper here for you to read. And the things that he said here are the things that I believe, because I believe he's in touch with God, that really need to be accomplished in this conference. So for you to be on the same page, you need to read this and read it slowly, pray about it as you read it, and say, Lord, help me to get together with my pastor, the leadership of this church, to get out of this conference what we need to. We all, listen, we all should be better by Wednesday night. Amen. All of us should be better by Wednesday night. Unless you don't like what you hear this morning, you drop out and you go watch a football game somewhere today, whatever you want to do. But all of us should be better by Wednesday night than we are right now. That's what we're doing here in this life. We're trying to be better. Uh, God created it. Man messed it up. And he's left us here to make things better, to align what has been messed up with God's will. And of course, ultimately, he will make it all right in the future. But right now, we have a part in all of that to make things better than what they are. Now, I'm going to ask you to open your Bible this morning to the book of Song of Solomon. We're talking about Christ alone. Now, this is a, uh, this is a strange book even in any Bible conference. <laughs> in a missions conference, you're wondering, if you know anything about this book, you're saying, what in the world are we going to Song of Solomon for? But we will make our point, and the point that we make here this morning, we will follow up as the week goes on. So stay with me, if you will. Song of Solomon. Now, I'm just going to read a very small portion of it here. We're going to jump into chapter number five, and um, then I'm going to give you some background for the book so you understand where it's coming from. This is one of the more difficult books in the Bible. The book of Revelation is difficult. The book of Hebrews is difficult. Uh, the first 12 chapters, 11 chapters of Genesis can be very difficult, particularly the early chapters when you're talking about creation. There's a lot of controversy about all of that stuff. But so Song of Solomon is a different book. It's a romance. And you would think, why would God put something like this really in the Bible? And we're going to tell you or answer that question in just a moment. Song of Solomon, chapter number five. The writer, the author, now this is the male in the story. There's only three people that talk in eight chapters. Solomon, the king, the Shulamite, his bride, and the third is a group of people called the Daughters of Jerusalem. They're a chorus, and those three speak. And it's not announced who's speaking. You have to follow the context of the story to understand who is actually talking at any given time. But right now, picking up the story in chapter number five, it says, I am come into my garden, my sister. This is the husband to his wife, he calls her my sister, my spouse. I have gathered my myrrh with my spice. I have eaten my honeycomb with my honey. I have drunk my wine with my milk. Eat, O oh friends, drink, yea, drink abundantly, O oh beloved. Notice there's a paragraph marking in your King James Bible, and that signifies, in this case, a change in who's speaking. Who is speaking is his bride, his spouse. She's asleep. The husband has kind of brought us into an introduction into the chapter, and he is going to approach the bedroom where his wife is sleeping. And we read, I sleep, but my heart waketh. It is the voice of my beloved. Her husband is knocking at the door. 
saying, open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my undefiled, for my head is filled with dew and my locks with the drops of the night. There's a lot of metaphorical language and imagery in this. I have put off my coat. This is the bride speaking. How shall I put it on? She's in bed. She's prepared herself to go to bed. I have washed my feet. How shall I defile them? I, I've taken a bath, so to speak. I'm all cleaned up, ready for bed. If I get up right now, I'm going to get dirty again. My beloved, this is the husband, put in his hand by the hole of the door and my bowels were moved for him. All of a sudden, the wife gets excited. Well, my husband's come to see me, to approach me, to have a relationship with me. I rose up to open to my beloved, and my hands dropped with myrrh, and my fingers with sweet-smelling myrrh upon the handles of the lock. I opened. He was knocking. She opens the door to my beloved, but my beloved had withdrawn himself. He didn't want to bother her. He had desires. She didn't. The timing was bad. She had a proverbial headache. Okay, let's put it that way. <laughs> Beloved had withdrawn himself and was gone. My soul failed when he spake. I sought him. She's saying, you know, I missed an opportunity to get together with my husband. What was I thinking? She was kind of half asleep, thinking of herself. Now she's thinking, my husband has come for me, but I could not find him. She opened the door, went outside, couldn't find him. I called him, but he gave me no answer. The watchmen that went about the city found me. They smote me. They wounded me. The keepers of the walls took away my veil from me. I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, if ye find my beloved, that ye tell him that I am sick of love, or we would say, I'm lovesick. I'm so sorry I didn't answer the door when my husband knocked. I should have opened, but my husband, he didn't want to bother me. So by the time I got to the door and got my whatever, my, my coat on and everything, he was gone. And now I want my husband, but I don't know where he is. If you find him, tell him I'm lovesick. Notice there's a paragraph, Mark. Question. What is thy beloved more than another beloved? O thou fairest among women. So this is the chorus of the daughters of Jerusalem. They're saying, so what's exciting about your husband that you're lovesick for him? What is thy beloved more than another beloved, O thou fairest among women? What is thy beloved more than another beloved that thou dost so charge us? In other words, you're giving us the responsibility to go out in the community and say, Hey, your wife wants you. She's lovesick. Why in the world do you think he's so important that you would charge us to go out in the community to find your husband and say, honey, I'm ready for you. This is a romantic story. This is why a lot of preachers really stumble with this, because it's too obvious, isn't it? It's too obvious what's going on here. But what is going on here? What is going on? So we've got the text, but let's move on to Song of Solomon in Christ alone. Remember, this is all about, whoops, we got the song still up there. We got to get rid of that. Now nothing is happening. <laughs> okay, in Christ, I'm gonna, I'm, am I going forward or didn't I turn? Yeah, it's on. I'm pressing the button and nothing is happening. Where is my technician up there? What am I doing wrong? There we go. There we go. Yeah. You got to stop drinking. I told you that when I came in here, all right? No more drinking in between services. You did such a good job in the first service. Anyway, get his name. Where are the bouncers? Could you have him removed? Never mind. All right. Song of Solomon is a love song written by Solomon. And it, as I said before, it's abounding with a lot of imagery, 
metaphorical language. And that's one of the reasons why it's a little bit difficult to understand. Historically, I believe it depicts the wooing and the wedding of a shepherdess. That's who the Shulamite was. She was of no special means. She was just a shepherd girl by King Solomon in the joys and the heartaches of wedded love. That's what this book is all about. Allegorically, it pictures Israel as God's espoused bride. In other words, there is a comparison here. The husband pictures God. The wife pictures God's wife, the nation of Israel, okay? If you've done any studying in the Bible, you can see the typology of this. But it also pictures Christ, the husband, and the church, Ephesians chapter 5, who is the bride. So there's at least three things going on here. There's the story that actually happened. There's also the typology of Israel and God and the typology of Christ in the church. Not to mention that there's a lot of personal stuff here. If you read through this, this is a great way, fellas, to learn how to treat your wife. This is a great book, ladies, to learn how to treat your husband. And that may be because it is on the verge of maybe being too intimate for some people that they shy away from this book. This is great marriage counseling. You're saying, in Christ alone, what does this have to do with it? Remember what the question was in verse 9. What is thy beloved more than another beloved? O thou fairest among women, what is thy beloved more than another beloved? That thou dost so charge us. This is a picture of a question being asked to the bride. What's so special about your husband? Now you can apply that personally or you can apply that prophetically to Jesus. You're the bride. We, the church, are the bride. What is so special about your husband? Your husband is Jesus Christ. What's so special about him? By the way, if you see him, tell him I'm lovesick. You ever felt like that for Jesus? Hey, if you, ever, if, if you see Jesus out there, if you run into him, tell him I'm looking for him. I'm lovesick. Do you remember when you were lovesick? Remember when you were maybe quite a bit younger? It would be nice if you were still lovesick. Remember when you were quite a bit younger and that first female or that first male paid attention to you? And we won't get into genders right now. I can't go there, okay? But remember... And you were so consumed with this one individual, you couldn't think of anything without, in my case, thinking of her. I wanted to be where she was. I wanted to be with her. In fact, I made a fool out of myself to make sure I could be with her. You know what I mean? You ever do that? I even went to the opera with my wife before we were mar married and told her I enjoyed it. <laughs> yes, I have many sins to confess. That being one of them, yes, many sins to confess. But I wanted to please her because I was lovesick. I have to stop and ask myself, am I still lovesick? Am I still lovesick? I've been married for 54 years, 55 years. Am I still lovesick? I got saved in 1972. I couldn't get enough of the Bible. I opened the Bible. I read everywhere. I read through. The fellow that led me to the Lord, he said, you need to read next week. You need to read the Gospel of John. The next three days, I read the Gospel of John. I couldn't wait. I couldn't wait a week to read the Gospel of John. I was lovesick. Where do I go now? I, uh, what do I do now? I, I trusted Christ as Savior. Where do I go? Well, there's a church. I ended up pastoring that church. But there's a church. They have a Bible study. You need to go there. I went home. I told my wife. She wasn't saved. I said, we're going to a Bible study Friday night. She said, okay. Let's go. We went. You know why? Because I was lovesick. I was lovesick for Jesus. 
You know what this conference is all about? If anything will happen in a missions conference, it's because the people get lovesick. They get lovesick for Jesus. It's not about the church. It's not about the missionaries. It's not about the building. It's not about the printed material. All of that stuff is good stuff. It's all about him is what it's all about. Being lovesick for Jesus, that's what it's all about. Now let me help you a little bit more here with Song of Solomon. We're not drinking anymore up there, are we? Okay, all right, good, all right. Applications of Scripture, I me mentioned that. These are some of them. The book itself is arranged in scenes like a play, like we just played it out for you. It's got the three main speakers, of, as I've said. Now, some ask the question, did Solomon really understand marital love? How could he? He had 700 wives. He had 300 combines, or no, I mean concubines. That's, combines, that's a farming <laughs> equipment, that's right. Anyway, he had 300 concubines. Now, how could a man with 700 wives understand marriage? Now, this is the way I look at that. He either knew a lot about marriage or he knew nothing about marriage. Anybody that would marry 700 women can't know enough about, can't know about marriage. That's all I can think of. And now, you know, it's not the wives that are the problem, though. It really isn't. 700 mother-in-laws. <laughs> can you imagine 700 mother-in-laws? I, can, I can't, you know... You know, Adam and Eve, this, this story goes all the way back to them, doesn't it? Adam and Eve, you, you know, Eve was deceived and Adam fell anyway. He was loyal to his wife to a fault, we say, right? He was. He said, if she's getting kicked out, I'm going with her. You know why they got along so well? Because neither of them had a mother-in-law. <laughs> they didn't. In fact, Adam was Eve's mother. You never thought of that, did you? And Eve didn't have a father. Things were strange back then, really strange. Got off to a strange... Anyway, I just said those things to make you think, in case you can. <laughs> now, the book is ra arranged in scenes, as I said. We gave you the applications, the allegorical application. So, uh, am I going backwards right now? No, I'm... I'm going backwards. Why am I going backwards? I'm pressing the forward. <laughs> Guys, <laughs> you're still drinking. You're on your third bottle right now, I think. Did Solomon really understand marital love? Well, the book is arranged in scenes. As I said, we're going backwards. You're going the wrong direction. I don't know. I'm clicking the forward, I believe. Am I clicking the forward here? The left-hand side? The right hand side okay let's try that okay how am i doing now am i doing better i did have a couple drinks myself in between so maybe that's the maybe that's the problem so we'll get over that i forgive me forgive me please do all right like i said i'm a sinner what's the purpose of the book what's the purpose of the book here here's several purposes for the book and some of them i've already given to you uh some people just think that the book is fiction they don't really understand the story. But the last thing on this list is important for all of us. One can learn much from the dialogue how married couples are to behave with one another. Put some romance in your relationship. Now, that's not an easy thing. It's not something that can be fabricated, although you can pretend. You can make pretend. Sometimes when we play the part, the part will follow. You understand what I'm saying? Sometimes we need to act a certain way and pretty soon we become that type of a person. Put a little romance back in your relationship. But the various scenes of the book exalt the joys of love and courtship and marriage and teach that physical beauty and sexuality in marriage should not be despised as base or unspiritual. It strikes a balance. It's not lustful but it's not so puritanical that you can't identify. It says things that could embarrass some people because when we talk about intimacy, it, is, it can be embarrassing, but it strikes a great balance. I want to challenge you to read through this particular book. 
it'll do you well. Song of Solomon, what is thy beloved more than another beloved? What is your beloved more than any other beloved? Are you lovesick for Jesus? That's going to be the difference, as I said before, by Wednesday night as we go through this week. How you grow in grace and in knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Sometimes preachers, and I are one who's guilty of this, sometimes preachers preach Jesus as an afterthought. He shows up at the end of the sermon for the invitation. I'm guilty of that. We're talking about various themes, topics, and the Bible talks about so many. But Jesus gets kind of pushed off to the side for a little bit until we get to the end, and then we kind of put a stamp of authenticity on the sermon by mentioning his name. Oh, by the way, you know everything that I just said for the last 35 minutes? Jesus would agree with me. And so that makes my sermon valid. Now, I've never said it that way, but maybe I've implied it that way in the way that I've preached, and I'm sorry. Now, what is it about him? That's what this series of messages is going to be all about. What is it about Jesus that has me lovesick? Now we're going to go to another somewhat difficult book in the Bible. We're going to go to the book of Hebrews. If you have a Bible, you can open to the book of Hebrews and you can check me out on the things that we're going to say here. The book of Hebrews, the primary purpose of the book of Hebrews is to show the immeasurable superiority of Jesus Christ. So if you want to know what the Bible says about Jesus, because that's what's really important, not just what I think of him, although that is important, but what does the Bible say about him, and do I think about him based on what the Bible says about him? The book is about the immeasurable superiority of Jesus Christ. The Hebrews were indoctrinated in Old Testament. Remember, we're talking about Hebrews as a book in the New Testament. We're talking a book that was written after the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. It could have been written as early as 40. It could have been 60, 70 AD. Different uh, commentators put different dates on it. The date really doesn't make any difference to me. The validity or the truthfulness of the book is what is important. Why was the book of Hebrews written? By the way, it doesn't have an author on it. Did you notice that? Uh, most books, you can, uh, like Song of Solomon, you can figure out who wrote this if you read through the whole book. He will identify himself as the author. But Paul or any other apostle or individual never identifies himself in the, in the book of Hebrews uh, as the author of the book. And the reason I believe is this, and I believe Paul wrote it, but I believe that he doesn't put his name on it because, remember, he was a Hebrew who had converted to Christianity. And I fear if his name was on this book that people would have said, seen that and automatically discounted what they read. Well, he's a traitor. He's a traitor. He became a Christian. He converted to, to Christ. Supposedly, he had an experience with Christ, and that would drive people away from the book. He didn't want, or the author didn't want, anyone driven away from the book on the basis of the author of the book. But in this book, he extols the greatness of Jesus Christ over and over. One by one, the truths that they, the Hebrews or Jews, boasted in, were shown to be only symbolic, prophetic, and insignificant compared to their fulfillment in Jesus Christ. So that's how the book is written. This is what you Jews have. It's inferior to who Jesus is. This is what you Jews had. This is who Jesus is. And so you see through the book constant comparisons as to why Jesus Christ is superior to the Old Testament rituals and rites and commandments and prophets and leaders in the Old Testament. He is far superior to all of them. The book is directed at Hebrews to persuade them of Christ's superiority. 
And the book is written to the nation of Israel, saved and lost. It's God's specific New Testament attempt to reach out and convince his chosen people. They're special to him. They are his chosen people. In every way, Christ supersedes everything under the old covenant. And that's what you read about as you begin to go through the book of Hebrews. It tells us there that um, Jesus is better than the angels in chapter number one, verse four. It says Jesus has a better hope or brings a better hope, chapter seven, verse 19. In chapter eight, verse six, it's a better covenant with better promises. In chapter 10, it has better substance. In chapter 11, it leads you to a better country or final resting place. A better resurrection, 11 verse 35, and then better things in chapter 12 in verse number 24. So the book of Hebrews is all about Jesus and why Jesus is superior to the Old Covenant, to the Old Testament, to the Mosaic Law, to the Levitical Law, all of those things that the Jews were practicing, the author of the book of Hebrews is saying, hold it. Those were all pictures. They were types leading up to the real thing. And Jesus is the real thing. Are you getting lovesick a little bit? little lovesick. Boy, I want to be with her. I want to be with her. I wonder what she's doing tonight. Oh, I hope she's home so I can call her up. I'm talking about me and my wife. I hope she's there. I'm lovesick for my wife of 55 years. Are you lovesick? For Jesus. That's what this is all about. Tell him. Tell them. If we have an invitation at the end, come on up here. Kneel down and say, God, forgive me for not being lovesick. Lord, I need to be lovesick. I need to have that sense about me that I had when I trusted Christ as my Savior 10 years ago, 4 years ago, 35 years ago, 60 years ago. I need to have that lovesickness. I couldn't get enough. I wanted to go to church. No football game would keep me from church. What, are you kidding me? It will now for many of us. In fact, a lot less than a football game. Maybe a little sniffle. Oh, I'm not feeling good this morning. I think I'm going to stay home and I'll watch it on the internet. Lovesick? I'll tell you what, I don't want to watch my wife on the internet. I want to be where she is. I want to be with her. I remember way back when. I remember when I was in Vietnam. I remember when I was in a foxhole. I remember when the supply chopper came in with ammunition and water and sea rats and it landed and it came in with mail. Mail from home. Mail from home. Oh, 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 I hope there's a letter from my wife in there. Mail call came. Grace. Brown. Grace. Smith. Grace. I get three. I get four letters, man. Some of the guys there got never, never got a letter. Never got a letter. Ever got a letter from home. I get two or three, four letters, legal stationery, two sides, handwritten, six pages, six pages, 12 pages, 18 pages. I'd look at the postmarks, the date. I'd line them up in chronological order. I'd go find myself a fun- comfortable foxhole, and I'd sit down in that foxhole, and I'd open them up, and I'd start reading, and my wife would start talking to me. Oh. Oh, oh, I want to be home. I can't tell you everything that she said in those letters. They wouldn't be put in the Bible. I know that. Solomon was much more discreet than my wife. (laughs) 
But I'm going to tell you something. Those letters kept me from going nuts. They kept me from going nuts. I read those letters. I was lovesick. You ever read the letter? You ever read the letter? It's right here. Hey, George, one of these days you're going to come home. Not going to be any more battles, no more fights, no more sin, no more of that garbage you have to deal with. And you're coming home. I love you. I can't wait for you to come home. Love sick. I got a letter from home right here. Right here. I got a letter. You get it? Is that how you feel when you read the Bible? Oh, I got a love letter from home. God's speaking to me. He's talking to me. A love letter from home. And it's all about Jesus. He's the focal point of the book. He's crowned with glory and honor, Hebrews 2.9. He's the apostle and high priest of our confession, chapter 3, verse 1. He's made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Chapter 6, verse 20. He's made a surety of a better testament. Chapter 7, verse number 22. He's the new and living way into the holiest. Chapter 10, 19 through 20. He's the author, Bobby, and the finisher of our faith. Mark, he's the author. He's the beginner. He's the finisher of our faith. There's only one reason you're going to go to heaven, and I hope you do. That you're going to go to heaven, and I believe you are. We're going to, wherever we're going, we're going together, brother. I want you to know that. It's Jesus. Because Jesus said this, and I believe him. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. I'm lovesick. I'm lovesick. It's getting closer, too. I am no longer old. I have become elderly. 75.6. That's the life expectancy of my generation. I'm older than that. I should be in a wheelchair, in an insane asylum. I don't know, someplace. <laughs> but I still got a, maybe a couple more weeks to go. He's the author and finisher. He's the mediator of the new covenant. He's the one who sanctifies his people with his own blood. I want you to go back to Hebrews chapter... I'm almost done. Almost done. I'm probably done too early, but I'm almost done. Go back to Hebrews chapter number one. I want to read you something else about Jesus. You're going to like this. This is really where this book begins. It begins in the first chapter with these powerful statements about him. If you wonder who I'm talking about, maybe you've never been to a church like this, and you say, who's this Jesus guy? By the way, maybe half the world has never heard his name. And probably half of the other half really doesn't know who he is. They've heard the name, but they couldn't tell you much about him. They don't know about him the things that you know about him. Look at he Hebrews 1. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days, spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things. That's who Jesus is. He also made the worlds, verse 2. He's the brightness of God's glory, verse 3. He's the express image of his person, in verse 3. All things, he's upholding all things by the word of his power, verse 3. By himself purged our sins. It's the blood of Jesus Christ, God's son that cleanses from all sin. The only hope that you and I have is in Jesus Christ. It's not in a religion. It's not in a church. It's not in a religious personage. It's in the person of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who died on the cross, paid for your sins, purged them. He was buried. He rose from the dead. He is alive today. He's seated at the right hand of the Father, and he is coming again. If you're saved, he's coming for you. And then... He sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. 
and he's making intercession for you and I, and he's just waiting, like my wife. Oh, George, one of the days, uh, one of these days, this war will be over, you'll be able to come home. I take out my calendar, it had a year on it. I put an X to another day, one more day closer to coming home. We're going to have a good time. We're never going to have to be separated ever again. I love you. I miss you. I'm lovesick. I'm lovesick. Do you know what I'm talking about? It's the kind of attitude that we're supposed to have towards Jesus. Love sick. It starts with one word desire. Do you have the desire to be love sick about Jesus? That's the question. And that's the invitation. Do you have a desire to be love sick? Remember what it used to be like. It's time to get real again. Get with him. Spend some time with him. Make a phone call. We call it prayer. Talk to him. Open the book. Let him talk to you. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Lord, I thank you for the patience of these people. Lord, I thank you for this book, your word. I'm overwhelmed, just, I have a responsibility to talk about you. I probably didn't do a very good job, I'm sorry, but I tried. So much to say about you, I don't know if I said the most important things or not, but God, it's in Christ alone. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Lord, he is our Savior, our Messiah, he is the one, by himself, on that cross, paid for our sins. Lord, we're thankful for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed, no one looking around.